Okay, just watch. Three, two, one. This is Thailand's Meklong Market. About an hour south of Bangkok, every day, beginning at 6.20 in the morning, a train runs through Meklong Railway Market, one of the largest produce and seafood markets in Thailand. Through the stalls selling fruit, ice cream, fish, through everything. And if you're wondering which came first, the market or the train, the answer is the market. The Meklong Railway built a commuter train to Bangkok back in 1905. The track they laid ran right through the middle of this market, which had been around for decades. Rather than moving, the vendors stayed put, adjusting their business to the train times. Eight times a day, seven days a week. ปุ๊บๆๆๆภายใน3 this system has been perfected over the years. With produce just inches from the train's wheels, tourists and vendors wait as the train passes through. Then, everything goes back to normal. Or at least as normal as an active train line market can be. When you highline often, you really learn to train your fear like a muscle. Sometimes the height isn't the scariest part. Sometimes it's the exposure, which is how much space you can perceive around you. My name is Faith Dickey, and I'm a professional slackliner. So slacklining is the umbrella term for all the different facets of walking on a flat, woven band. One of these facets is highlining, which is walking a slackline high off the ground. One of the best ways to train for highlining is setting up slacklines over water. When the current is passing underneath you, you automatically start to fall that same direction, and it's almost like you're not in control of your body. And that's great practice for highlining, because in highlining, when you're dealing with all the fear and adrenaline, oftentimes it feels like you're not in control of your own body either. Chamonix is a town in the Alps of France. And it's one of the places that really drives me in highlining. What's different about highlining in the Alps is that the whole experience is more intense. Being that high off the ground, you look at the valley below and the houses are just tiny specks. They look like toys. It's unbelievable. One of the high lines that I walked recently in Chamonix was on Aguil du Midi. And when we reached the top, it was a totally clear blue sky and we were surrounded by peaks. But during the process of rigging, the clouds started to roll in. It was like an acid trip walking the line. I was out there in space and exposure trying to balance and the line was swinging beneath me. Meanwhile, these huge white clouds were passing and the line would disappear, the anchor would disappear and then it would reappear. And there was no way to control it. I just had to hang on. Yes! <laughs> the beauty of the mountains is awesome and yet it is a landscape that demands focus and respect. Alpine highlining is the purest form of the sport I can think of. Side note, no bread makers were injured in the making of this video.
As you can probably gather, this is not your average bread maker, nor is this your average bread oven, nor is it your average bread. This is Shatis Puri, and in Georgian that translates to, well, bread. Es arten tasvistaria hatsem tkhum, erkuazar erkutivits arten hatsem tkhum, ekelim brastanits, hayastanum, bratsakan hatsem tkhum, toniri hats, puri. Et hin hin vakt vors svelen toniri sarkela. Onsor ofta gortelen et kav, kavovin sarkel, michev esor ten sen sarkum et miban vor popokotsun lini toniris chista. A toner oven is essential to the making of shotis puri. After the oven is built and the heat is turned up to the highest level for six to seven hours, the walls of the oven are covered in a salt-based liquid. And diving in to get the bread as close to the fire is just a part of the job. As if diving into a clay pot isn't intense enough, this thing hits temperatures of 750 to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. The end result is a special bread with a salty twist that's eaten on special occasions like birthdays, weddings, Christmas, and New Year's. <laughs> They call this stretch of the North Shore the Seven Mile Miracle. There's a world-class surf break every hundred or so yards. We rescue up to a thousand people a year. Definitely one of the most dangerous stretches of beaches in the world. My name is Tao Hanneman, and I've been a lifeguard for 14 years here on the North Shore. I work here at Eukai Beach Park. It's the home of the surf break bonsai pipeline, which is a very dangerous wave that breaks in very shallow water. It's such a critical wave that if you fall down, the chances of getting injured, of hitting the reef is, is very high. Even when it's really small, we have very strong, powerful rip currents. It's very easy to get swept out in the rip current and not be able to make it back to shore. Just yesterday, the lifeguards made about 20 rescues. Knowing that the possibility of drowning is very real, you know, especially in large surf, we all train. My training consists of running the beach, of swimming, anything basically in my area. We do mock rescues. If the surf is big, I'll tell one of my partners, hey, go, go out and get pounded in the surf. I'll, I'll, I'll come get you with a rescue tube. So he'll go out and like, you know, he's taking waves on the head and, and we'll see how fast we can get to him. Whatever the ocean's gonna do, if someone needs help and you have to go get that person, you gotta be ready to, to do that. You're putting yourself in a very risky situation, but knowing that your partner has your back, there's, it, it builds a strong sense of camaraderie. We have a good morale between us all. We do this job for the love of the job. Basically, if you, if you can save another person's life, it's very rewarding, for sure. During a storm, we are at war with Mother Nature. These avalanches can be deadly, and the best way to mitigate them is with explosives. Here at Mammoth Mountain, it's a blast from the past. We literally use World War II cannons. Fire! Detonation! Detonation! My name is Matt Seibert. I'm a Mammoth Mountain ski patroller. On any given day, we can see anywhere between 5,000 and 18,000 guests. We try to keep a constant watch on the mountain and changing conditions to create the safest environment possible. 
Steep slopes, large snowfall, intense winds are all recipes for an avalanche. I've worked in our artillery program here on Mammoth Mountain for the past seven years. The howitzer was originally a World War II weapon of war. Now discontinued in the war theater, it is now a valuable tool for avalanche mitigation. Our whole team feels secure when the gun goes out and fires. It's able to reach targets that we would not normally be able to reach with just throwing hand charges. Detonation! Clear reach! Our intent is to create many small controlled avalanches as opposed to letting the snow rest and winding up with one large devastating avalanche. We fire our gun 90% of the time blind in a storm without being able to see our target. We are capable of dialing in on one tiny little rock and nailing it on the nose. The risks are real. Um, upper mountain wind slab is considerable danger. Each day we arrive at work, we put our name on the board for accountability. We go out together, we work together. At the end of the day, we come in together, take our name off the board, and we don't stop work until the last one of us is in for the day. I do take joy knowing that there are families out here recreating, having fun, bringing up the next generation of skiers and snowboarders, enjoying the mountain. It's a job I love and it's my goal to create the safest environment for our guests.